Okay, hello, you're welcome to my channel. Now, in this video, we want to solve some examples on aging values and aging functions of a second order linear differential equations. Okay, so, well, this is not actually the kind of example we want to solve, right? But I have some things for us to note over here. So, after taking note of all these things, then we will apply them in solving some examples. Okay. But before then, maybe while, while we are taking note of this, we are doing, looking at it here so that we will get a better understanding of all these points I have written over here. All right. So now consider the second order differential equation. All right. This is a, actually a Stomlovio form problem. This right here. All right. And over here, we have some boundary conditions. We have that y evaluated at the extreme point zero is the same thing as y evaluated at the other end. L for any length L bigger than zero and the evaluation gives us zero as an output so we have um, the extreme ends right they are being held the same so that all we want happens at the center okay great now this coefficient of y over here this lambda lambda is just a real number meaning that lambda can be negative numbers or lambda can be zero and lambda can be bigger than zero now this lambda over here, it is a very important, plays a very important role because lambda can decide the kind of solution that we have. Now, look at the point one. We have that in this particular problem, y equivalent to zero is a solution to this problem. Reason being that if we have y to be zero, right? If we differentiate y twice, we are still gonna have zero. If y is zero, y times this lambda is zero. So all in all, the left-hand side and the right-hand side will be the same. So that means y being zero is a solution to that problem. So such solution is called a trivial solution of that problem. Anyway, our value of lambda can determine whether we will have um, other solutions to this problem or whether we will have only the trivial solution to that problem. Okay, now take note of the point two, that the value of lambda for which this problem okay has a non-trivial solution is called an aging value so that is what the point two is telling you that an aging value of a problem is a value of lambda for which the problem has a non-trivial solution okay so maybe while solving this finding in in order to seek the aging value and the aging function of this problem we will come across something like this okay maybe let's just apply this at once and start solving all right so we take note that our lambda is a real number Okay, so maybe we can consider lambda as a negative number, lambda as a zero, and lambda as a positive number. Well, to shorten the length of this video, I'm gonna tell you that lambda being, negative num being a negative number will not satisfy this problem. Okay, will not give us a different value for this problem. So lambda being a, a negative number is not an aging value of this problem. So I want to consider two cases only. Okay, I don't want to consider the third case, so the two cases will be when lambda is, is zero and when lambda is bigger than zero. Okay, so this will be the case one and this will be the case number two. Now let's just look at this and look at it accordingly, all right? Okay, so case one, we have that when lambda is zero, now you observe that in the differential equation, if lambda is equal to zero, it will reduce that our equation to having y double prime to be equal to zero. Reason being that when lambda is zero, lambda times y will just be zero. So we are having y double prime equals to zero on the right hand side. Okay, great. Since that is the case, hmm, this simply means that to get the, the function, okay, y that satisfies this, all right, we will need to recall our methods of solving second order linear equation. In this case, this is a homogeneous uh, linear second, second order linear equation. So because the right hand side is just zero. So we can use, we can write this as a characteristic equation, maybe using a y, m, an r, or an m, and solving for that value, and we know how we represent them, right? So here I will say let, we write this in terms of r. So we're gonna have r squared, which is equal to zero. That is the characteristic equation. All right, great. So the value of R or the values of R that satisfy this equation will be R equal to zero. 
Now, since R has been squared, in fact, we are expected to have two values, even if they are repeated values. So I would like to have R1 to be zero, and I'll also rewrite this as R2 is zero, so that I have two values of R, because these are the only values that satisfies this equation. Okay, now since we have repeated values, real and um, equal roots of this characteristic equation, all right, our function will be of the form, y of x will be of this form, c1 plus uh, c2x. Again, when we have repeated roots like this, all we need to do is to go ahead and assume our y function to be exponential of, now, um, we have c1 exponential of the first root, which is this, okay, so if you have, let me just put it down for you, c1 exponential of the first root, which is 0x, all right, plus c is the repeated root, we multiply this with an x, and we take c2 exponential of the second root, which is still 0x, in fact, they are repeated, they are the same, so you see that exponential 0x is just 1, so we have the c1 over there, all right, and the same thing applies here, we still have x c2 so this is why i'm having this so it's just as a reminder for you okay so this will be our function when we have our r1 and r2 to be zero now this is the case where lambda is zero so we are still working on it okay now you observe that i told you that we had the boundary condition okay so to get this um aging value when we get the function itself, depending on the value of lambda, all we need to do is to plug in our boundary conditions, all right? We have that y evaluated at zero will be zero, and y evaluated at any point L bigger than zero will still be zero. So all we need to do is to plug in zero in place of x, so that means y of zero will be, obviously, we have it to be C1, where we plug in zero, okay, in place of x in this first equation right here. Okay, and you know that y evaluated at zero is said to be zero. That means that C1 is in fact zero. Great, so the next thing we have to do is to evaluate it at point L. So to plug it in L in place of X in this equation, we have C1 plus LC2, great. Now from this first equation here, let's call this one. Okay, since I'm pointing out to you. So from this first equation here, we saw that C1 is zero. So in fact, we put zero over here and we clean everything up. And what you see is that Y of L is LC2. Great, so we have that C1 is zero and Y of L, which is LC2, is in fact equal to zero due to the boundary um, conditions that Y of L is zero so since y of l is l times c2 this is equal to zero now the product of two terms is giving you zero which tells you that at least one of them is zero we know that from the given problem that this boundary condition this is the end point of the interval what is the initial point l is bigger than zero so that means that l is not equal to zero so the only thing that is making this to be zero is this c2 so this tells us that c2 is also zero. So we now have the value of C1 and we now have C2. Okay, so from the assumed function that y of x is C1 plus C2 of x, C2 times x, if you have C1 to be zero and you have C2 to be zero, in fact, that gives us a trivial solution, y of x to be zero plus zero, which is just zero. So since um, lambda equal to zero gives us y of x to be zero, it tells us that lambda is not an aging value from this point two. So we have that an aging value of a problem is a value of lambda for which the problem has a non-trivial solution. So I pointed out that y zero being zero is a trivial solution. So since lambda equals to zero, okay, since lambda equals to zero is giving us a trivial solution, when you solve for the values of C1 and C2, it shows that that lambda is not an aging value. All right, so lambda equals to zero does not satisfy what we want. So we need to go ahead and investigate where lambda is bigger than zero. Now, 
I only showed it lambda equals to zero because I ignored the first case where lambda is less than zero because it's still going to not be an aging value. It's still going to give us a trivial solution. Okay, so let's just investigate when lambda is bigger than zero real quick and then we'll get on into the examples in our next video. Now, considering the second case here where lambda is bigger than zero. So maybe we just go ahead and we write this equation. We have y double prime plus lambda y is zero. So if lambda is not equal to the, is not equal to zero, so we, we are not having a zero multiple with y. So this y is still going to be here. Okay, so just like we did initially, we would like to go ahead and rewrite this, okay, in, in a characteristic equation using r, all right? So just deciding any, any dummy variable. So by using r and rewriting this as we know already, this will be r squared plus lambda equal to zero. Okay, so you just have to move lambda to the right hand side and take the square of both sides just to get the value of r. So all in all, we are going to have that r is positive and negative i square root of lambda when you go ahead and do that. Now, when we get a complex conjugate um, result like this, so this is a conjugate result and it's complex, it could be zero plus i square root of lambda or zero minus i square of lambda. So that's a conjugate complex roots. Okay, so when we have that, our solution will be of this form, noting that the real part of this, of each of the, of the complex roots is zero. So our solution, y of x, will be of the form c1 cosine of, well, what we need to put here is the imaginary part, right? And you do, and you don't care about the sign. So square root of lambda, you bring in the x, then you add it with c2 sine of, again, the same argument, square root of lambda times x. So you don't care about the signs in front. Okay, now that we have the function y, like we did earlier, we will look at the boundary uh, conditions, all right? So we have here, y evaluated at zero should be zero, and y evaluated at the end point L should still be zero. So we look at y evaluated at point zero. Okay. So all we need to do is just to make a substitution. Well, take note that this right here is an argument, like is the angle, cosine of the whole of that and sine of the whole of that, all right? This x is not being multiplied with everything. No, it's a, it is in the angle, so don't be confused with that. So when we plug in x to be zero, take note that cosine of zero is going to be one. Here we are just having c one. You plug in x to be zero, sine of zero is zero. So everything here on this second term is zero. Okay, great. And when we have y evaluated at zero, it is going to be zero. So we equate c1 to zero. So that means that c1 is zero. In fact, it seems as if we are going to have the same thing like we had initially, where we had the two arbitrary constants to be zero. And that gave us a trivial solution. Well, let's check. Let's look at the second condition. We have that y evaluated at the point L. Well, all we need to do is to go ahead and substitute L in place of X in the original equation of Y. But take note that since C1 is zero, we are going to ignore this first term because zero times whatever I see is gonna be zero. So all we need to do is to substitute L in place of X over here. We are gonna have C2 then sine of, well, this will be um, square root of lambda L, all right? Okay. Great, and we equate that to zero because y evaluated at point L is still zero. Okay, irrespective of the change of the equality signs. All right, now, here is the deal. In order not to have a trivial solution like we had earlier, since we already have um, the first constant C1 to be zero, if C2 is still zero, we are going to have a trivial solution like we had. So we are going to assume that in this product of two terms, C2 should not be zero, all right? We have that C2 should not be zero so that we do not have a trivial solution. We don't want it, all right? That simply means that this other term, sine of um, square root of lambda L is the zero. Okay, so our aim here is to find the value of lambda that satisfies this other equation, all right? Great. So this whole process here, this is where we now have to get the aging value. And from there, we get the corresponding aging function. Okay, so sine of which angle will give us zero? 
we know that when we have sine pi, we have zero. When we have sine zero, we have zero. Sine two pi, zero. So all the multiples of pi, sine of that will always give us zero. So that means that this argument here, in fact, is the same as saying that the square root of lambda times L is the same thing as n pi, where n runs all over the integers bigger than or equal to one. Great. Now, that means when we plug in this in place of that, it will satisfy this equation, sine of which angle will give us zero. So like I said, all the multiples of pi, so both odd and even multiples. Okay, so if you want to look at this and try to solve for the value of lambda, like we said, it determines the kind of solution we have. That will be in by dividing both sides by L and squaring both sides. So we're going to have that lambda will be n squared pi squared over L squared. Like I just said, divide both sides by L and um, square both sides to get rid of the square root. Okay, great. So at this point, this right here is the aging value, all right? And you have to do this, put it down as a sequence. It will generate some stuff for you. Like I have written here, n is bigger than or equal to one. So n can start from one. Okay, there are integers. It gets to two and three. So it is a sequence it will be generating for you. So this whole stuff here is our, are the aging values, given that n is bigger than or equal to one. Okay, great. So we have successfully gotten the aging value of that problem. So this aging value are the values in which the solution will not have in which the solution or the problem will not have a trivial solution. Okay, then we look at this state point, we have the non-trivial solution. Okay, the non-trivial solution is called the aging function associated with lambda, which is the aging value. So the aging function is the, the non-trivial solution associated with the aging value. So to actually get the aging function from this value, all we need to do is to look at the, the values of the constant C1, then since C1 is zero, every term here will be taken care of. Then we now look at the other term and we get something nice. In fact, let's just do it over here real quick. Okay. Now to get the aging function, we need to look at this function, y of x, all right? Now we saw that our value of C1 was zero. So this will kill all this term. So the only thing we have left is C2, then sine of the whole of that, all right? So sine of now square root of lambda. So what is our lambda sub n? It is all of this. So we take the square root of this, we like taking the square root of the all of that, then we multiply it by x. So we will just enter with n pi over x, all right? And we, sorry, over L, all right? And we multiply x with that. So this is the corresponding uh, aging, the corresponding solution. So this is called the aging function, while this is the aging value. So this, that is how we get the stuff, all right? Great. Now, take note of this last stuff here, that a non-zero constant multiple with an aging function is also an aging function. With this statement, I can simply take off this C1, C2, and just plug in one over there. This simply means a non-zero constant multiple with an aging function is also an aging function. So I can change it from C2 to, to even one to just make it look simple, right? You can use two and so on, provided it's a non-zero constant multiple. Okay, so now we've considered the four cases. I think this will now be very easy, okay? So we'll now be applying this to solving some examples for you guys. All right, thanks for watching.